Thank you, Alice, and uh, I would invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. We finish up this chapter. It's a great, great chapter and a great book, and uh, we want to continue as we finish up Paul's focus on being single-minded. And, uh, you know, I I know that many of you are excited because today brings back football for the majority of you, right? You're excited about all that stuff. And that's good. I know you're cheering against my team, and I'm not necessarily excited about yours. Here's the reason why. Every time your team wins the Super Bowl in the last 10 years, Alabama wins. Or every time you lose a Super Bowl, Alabama wins the national championship. Every time national championship is lost by Alabama, you guys win a Super Bowl. You see a connection here? So we're, we're at odds, but it's okay. We'll get through it. You guys enjoy Sunday. I'll enjoy Saturday. Sort of a Saturday habit of our, mine anyway, my brother David out in California and a couple others, is we love to uh, just, you know, it's game day. So we're talking about the game and, and uh, we're going on and my, my nephew, he's, he, he's got box seats uh, this particular week and, and so he's showing us pictures of his box seats and all this kind of stuff. And then my brother David, he says, hey... I'm going to this game, the, uh, the University of Southern California versus Stanford. Well, I have a favorite meme that I use when I think it's just, well, why would you do that on purpose? Um, it's this little baby that's sitting on the couch, falls asleep, goes, <laughs> and So I send that to him. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But the man that I'm going with needs Jesus. And he's a USC fan. He wanted me to come along with him. And so he sends a picture later. Guess what garb he's wearing? Of course, Alabama. He's representing Alabama, but he's sitting in the USC section. But here's, here's, here's my point. Is, is David, and one of the things that I love about David, is he's on mission. He's going to a game that he has really no care about uh, against teams that we really don't, you know, what's the big deal? Stanford, USC. USC ended up trouncing them and just kind of go. But nonetheless, I know what you're thinking. We won 62 to 10. (laughs) Yeah, it's fun for me. But nonetheless, David was willing to go there because he's building a relationship with one of his neighbor friends and to be able to to witness to him. And and, and in reality, that's what, what Paul's trying to teach us as we go through this book in a particular chapter one is that we're really to live our lives on mission. Single-mindedness for the furtherance of the gospel. That's what we're to be really about. And, and, and so as we l- looked at last week and we were challenged last week that the kind of joy that Paul talks about in this book, because when we come to Philippians, pe- people think about joy all the time. And the kind of joy that Paul talks about here and Paul experienced was, he says, a direct result of the single-mindedness concerning the furtherance of the gospel, being on mission. And this led us to an important truth that we ended with last week that I want to bring back to our attention. Joy for the Christian can be a reality when every aspect of our life, our vocation, marriage, parenting, community involvement like we did yesterday afternoon, or yesterday morning too, and, 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 and even church ministry, it, joy can come if it's an extension of our calling to have Christ formed in us, first of all, and in others when we're on mission. And so Paul brings, as he, as he brings this focus on being single-minded to a close, he challenges the church in Philippi to rally to that mission. The mission that was clearly laid out in passages like Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, where we're told to go in all the world, and Acts chapter 1, where you're told that we're to be His witnesses. However, there have always been things that distract the church, and there's no doubt that today we live in a day of options and distractions. So it's easy, to, it's really easy to get off track. And Paul and he's these final verses of chapter 1 provides great clarity about what we as a church are to be about and the potential hardships that that may entail for us. So as we begin to look at this passage, I want, I want to get this thing in your mind, this thought in your mind. God desires 
his people to unify, unify around the vision of reaching their world for Christ with full confidence that he's building his church. Yet, yet, this is important, with full knowledge that there could be serious opposition to our efforts. Now, we, we see in this first chapter, Paul had no doubts concerning the power and the truth of the gospel. This is why he sold out to proclaim it wherever God led him, and no matter what circumstances God led him into. Everywhere he went, he mobilized the church to do the same. And so now more than 2,000 years later, his challenge comes new and fresh to us, and the big question we have before us is whether or not we will rise to that challenge. So let's, let's read the passage, and then we'll have prayer and move our way into it. Listen to what Paul says in relationship to the focus of being on mission. Here's what he says in verse 27 of chapter 1 of Philippians. Only, in light of what he's just said earlier, convinced, in verse 25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue uh, with you all, your progress and joy in the faith. There it is, that idea of, of growth and maturity, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Then he says these words, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. And that from God, and that from God, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Let's pray. Father, we look at this passage, and, and uh, there's so many great truths here to be heard and to be understood. We love the idea of the privilege of the gospel, and it saves us from our sin and gives us the gift of eternal life. Paul talks about the privilege to suffer for that gospel as well. And that doesn't ring as, as wonderful in our hearts as being saved from the power of sin and having eternal life. So there's, there's a conflict of sorts that, that comes up in this passage, but it's at the very heart of why Paul experienced joy even in prison. Because he knew what the mission was, clear on that. And he desired to live that out. And now he's challenging this church. And now 2,000 years later, as we read this passage, he's challenging us as well. So use your word, we pray, to guide us in your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now as we look at this passage, it's pretty easy to see how it breaks down. Verse 27 is, uh, is, is the idea that we, we are not to, we're, we're not to stand alone. We're to come together, unified. Verse 28 talks about the fact that we're on the winning side. That's an encouraging note. Paul's challenging them. He says, look, let's stand together and, and keep in mind that as we face this opposition, we're on the winning side. That's verse 28. And then verse 29, he then brings up the subject as, okay, yes, there's opposition, which means that we have to be willing to suffer. And that's the part that gets really hard. But let's look at, first of all, the, the idea that we're not to stand alone. And that's in verse 27. In verse 27, there's basically two things that he wants to make sure we understand. First one is that we understand that there's an individual responsibility. Only let your conduct be. Okay? And, and, and so, worthy of the gospel is the idea. And the second one is the court. The second idea is the corporate responsibility, where we stand together, st standing firm, one spirit with one mind, striving side by side. And so there's, there's this idea that Paul is calling the, the church at Philippi, and they had their problems. You see that in chapter 3, you're going to see it in chapter 4. They had their problems just like every other church, where there was some friction, there was some tension, and there's some difficulties going on, and, and so Paul addresses those a little bit and, and as we go on. But here's what he's doing. He's calling the church to come together, to unify 
around the, the main goal that we have of reaching our world for Jesus Christ. And so he says, he wants us to understand that we don't stand alone. Only let your conduct be manner of life, be worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm. Okay? And so he, he talks about this individual responsibility first, because if we're going to stand together, we have to recognize our responsibility as individuals as we come together. And he uses a word that it has its root uh, of, uh, in the Greek word polis, which means city. And it, it's kind of hard to understand the word, the way he uses it. It, it means a city, but it carried the idea and he evoked a sense of, of uh, allegiance or pride in the city. Keep in mind, Paul speaking to a, a church in Philippi, a church that is in Philippi, which is a Roman city in the midst of a, a Greek culture. And yet, because of their status of this city and the citizens of this city being Roman citizens, it gave them greater status. There was, there was a sense of pride. There was a sense of, of allegiance to. This is who we are. And so we, we, we get that a little bit. I mean, you, you, you understand that, that uh, you're from New Hampshire, and we have the jokes about the different places. Uh, we have jokes about uh, people that live in Maine. We have jokes about people that live in Vermont. We have jokes about people that live in Massachusetts and, and all those things. You, you know that. And they have jokes about us, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Somebody says, no. Sure. We hear them, okay? And, and, and so, but there's a sense. We're from New Hampshire, right? Uh, uh, and and on, my, uh, on my Facebook feed, I guess they have some algorithms that are judging and watching everything that... That I, uh, that I post about. So apparently they have figured out that I live in New Hampshire, but I love Alabama. And so they're always trying to sell me some t-shirt, t-shirt says that I live in New Hampshire, but my heart is in Alabama. Now, how do they figure that out? I don't know. It, but that's what they're trying to do. And, and, and we, there's a certain which what they're trapping into is that allegiance, that pride of who you are and where you're from. And so, you know, that's what he, that's what this word really means. It's a pride in citizenship. And, and, and here's the thing. It carried with it, with the understanding that you are to represent your place of origin well. And so this word was used to communicate the responsibility of an individual to recognize that when you travel somewhere else or when, wherever you might be, you need to recognize that you represent something greater than yourself. You're a citizen of. Your allegiance is. You take pride in. And so this is the idea. Paul talks about this all the time. Look at, look at chapter 3, verse 20 of Philippians. Chapter 3, verse 20 says this. But our citizenship is in heaven. Same word, same idea here. Our citizenship is in heaven from from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who shall transform our lowly bodies. But Paul's saying, look, you are a citizen of, of Philippi, but your ultimate heaven. And so he, he, he emphasized that. Look in, look in Ephesians chapter uh, 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, he says, Therefore... A prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It's the same idea. Walk worthy of your citizenship that is in Christ Jesus. And then also in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, it says this, and, and uh, he, he talks about so then, or so as... Um, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him. You're His representative on earth. And Paul's prayer for the Colossian church is that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord as they move through everyday life. Then look over, if you will, in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. He says this, um, verse, starting in verse 11, for you know how like a father with his children, we are exhorting to, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner 
worthy of God, who calls you unto His kingdom and glory. And then Titus, in Titus uh, chapter, um, Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse, verse 10, here's what it says there. He says, that he talked about all these negative things, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn and beautify the doctrine of our God and our Savior. One fa- final passage outside of Paul's writing, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and verse 14. Here's what Peter says about this subject. He says in, in, in verse 11, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, in other words, the, the world in which we live in, the temporariness of it, since all be dissolved, what sort of people ought we to be in our lives of holiness and godliness? Then verse 14, he says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So there's this idea of coming together, and, and, but recognizing a personal responsibility to walk in a manner that is worthy of our citizenship in heaven, our relationship with God. Walk in a manner of worthy of who is your Savior, is the idea. So we don't stand alone, but we do have an individual responsibility. That responsibility is to live out the truth of the gospel in everyday life. You see, we get saved by the gospel, but then we live out the truth of the gospel every day, and then eventually we will be able to experience the fulfillment of the gospel as we live with Him forevermore. Right now, we're in that period between the time where we've gotten saved and the time where we're going to be delivered from this world and to experience forevermore with Him, and we're to live out the truth of the gospel, live in a manner worthy of the things that the gospel teaches us. And so he starts with that individual responsibility. This is who you are to be. Your your desire, your focus, your single-mindedness needs to be on living out the truth of the gospel in everyday life. The focus of your life needs to be on being truthful to the gospel and living that truly out. And then he talks corporately. The individual starts there, now the group, the corporate. And notice how he does this. As we, uh, we, we turn back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 27, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you. And now, here's what you have to understand. He's moved beyond the individualized aspect of things. He's talking about the, the, the group here, the corporate, the church. He says, I want to hear that you as a church, that you are standing firm, in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side together. And so the corporate responsibility is to stand firm. And that means to hold one's ground. Don't allow the opposition to the gospel and the the proclamation of the gospel and the advancement of the church, don't allow that opposition to push you back. Stand your ground. Set your feet is the idea. It's 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 a term that means to establish firm a uh, planted stance so that you are ready to take on the advance of whatever's coming towards you and that you are able to move forward. So positively, we stand with God and negatively, we stand against all that oppose Him. That's what he's talking about here in verse 27. See that, you, that you're standing firm that you are standing firm in the gospel and the truth of the gospel. You're standing firm for God and against any of the forces that may come against you. That's that's what he's talking about here, this, this responsibility of coming together in strength, standing firm. And then he talks about with one spirit and one mind. It's a call to unity, a unity around the focus and the vision of reaching our world for Christ and seeing Christ formed in us and informed in those around us as well. It's a call to unity, but not just for unity's sake. It's a call to unify around the the foundation and the firm faith and belief in the gospel. That's what he's calling us to. Look at this. He says, having uh, standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together side by side. The the one-mindedness again. 
Now he's moved beyond just having the single-mindedness that he talks about. He's talking about the single-mindedness of the church, being focused in on the furtherance of the gospel. This word striving together is an interesting word. It's very instructive, especially in light of some of the things that we'll see later on in chapter 4 and, and even in chapter 3. Because the Philippi church, the church of Philippi is just like any church. There's always some struggles that are going on. There's always difficulties that, that you're trying to work through. And, 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 and so we just have to recognize that. But we strive together. And this word striving together is a, an unusual word to, to translate in the Greek. It's, it's one of those things that it's, it comes, it's a combination word of together and the word for athlete. And so remember last week, I, I actually saw that commercial again yesterday. I didn't know what it was for. It's, I think it's for Gatorade, you know, the one that says you're always looking for somebody that's going to, you know, try to take you down and as an athlete, which will rise you up. Well, here's th that, that's presenting the fact that as an athlete, you're always going against an opposition. And Paul is actually talking about that here. But in this section, when he's talking to the church collective, he's talking about striving together. In other words, the idea is that we're not opposing one another. We are side by side, striving together, unified around the call of the, the fulfilling the gospel and taking it to others and living it out in our life. We stand side by side. We're not competing against, but we're competing with one another. We're locking arms and, and moving forward together. We strive together. That's the idea. Not, not competing against one another. And I think, I think the reality is we sometimes get that, uh, that wrong, where we end up striving against one another rather than striving together. And Paul's going to, as I said, Paul's going to address that. But he wants us to understand, first and foremost, that we don't stand alone. We, we are to come together for the cause of the gospel because we believe in the gospel. And so, as we look at verse 27, I, I would summarize it this way. Our conduct will not be counted as worthy. He's talking about let your conduct be worthy. Our, 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 our conduct will not be counted as worthy if we are not gospel-centered in our manner of life and our interaction with our culture. If that's not what we're about, we have to recognize that someday we're going to stand before God and we're going to have to give it an account. How is your life focused in on reaching your world? How is your life focused in on living out the gospel and impacting others around you with the truth of the gospel? That's what's going to be counted as worthy. All right, so let your lifestyle, your manner of life, or I think I am keep throwing in King James, your conduct, uh, even the old King James before the new King James came out, your conversation of life. It doesn't matter. All of them mean the same thing. The way in which we live needs to be living out the truth of the gospel. And, and as we do that, as we seek to live those kind of lives, uh, we, we're centered in on that. And then we'll be on mission. We'll, we'll, we'll understand the responsibility to taking that truth to the world. Now, Paul's not um, naive. He recognizes when he calls the church to this kind of living that there's going to be opposition. I mean, for goodness sake, he's in prison because of it. He's had people abandon him because of it. In chapter 1, he talks about he has people that are preaching the gospel to make life more miserable for him. They're doing things to make his life miserable. Chapter 2, we're going to get to the point where they've even forsaken him, abandoned him. So Paul understands the difficulties internally and externally. But he still calls the church to come together and, and to stand together. But he's not naive into thinking that it's all going to be hunky-dory when you do that. He's not. He talks about the fact that it's going to be difficult. But in verse 28, he wants to remind us, before he gets to the really difficult part, he wants to remind us that we're on the winning side. And verse 28 is one of those glorious passages because he tells us to be fearless and to be assured. To be fearless and to be confident we're on the winning side. Look at how he does this, verse 28. He says, and, and not to be frightened. The, the, the word here is, 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 is in the sense not of somebody does something and you're, you're startled. No, this, this is where the word kind of carries the idea where you, you begin to shrink back. 
because you're, you're afraid of what, what may happen or what they could do to you. And, and, and so he says this, don't, don't be frightened in anything by what the opponents may do. And, and keep in mind, Paul's, Paul's not just talking here, um, you know, in, in theory. Paul's not just talking here like, uh, you know, it could get a little rough. We, we, we live in a world where somebody might uh, laugh at us or they might slam the door in our face or they, they might unfriend us on Facebook. I, mean, I know how tragic that can be and how upsetting that can be, but that's not what Paul's talking. Paul's in jail. Paul, Paul does, he, he's, he's anticipating he's going to be let free, but he doesn't know. As a matter of fact, he's going to get free for a while and then he'll be put back in jail and he will die. For the same things. So Paul's not just talking here in theory. Paul's living this out. He understands. He's on the winning side. He says, but don't be afraid. So we wonder, why does Paul have such joy? We, we face all kinds of life circumstances. And, and I'm sure that Paul went through days where what God was doing, what God was, was leading him to, uh, through, didn't make sense to him. I mean, God told him that he was going to take him through and he was going to, he was going to reach the world. God was going to use him to, to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul, Paul had given this great thing, but, but God also said, I'm going to make you suffer some things. And I'm sure that when Paul gets taken to Rome as a prisoner, that wasn't how he planned out his strategy of how to get the gospel to Rome. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that didn't come in any flow chart that he might have put together or, or any strategic plan in the next five years. I'm pretty sure that wasn't in on it. But that's what God chose to lead him through and the hardship and the difficulty that was. I'm sure that Paul didn't want to go to the island of Malta as a shipwreck and get bitten by a snake that should have killed him. I don't know about you, but I don't like snakes. And I surely don't like getting bit by snakes. And some of you are already getting the heebie-jeebies out there. And you're going to dream about these things, okay? You're going to think about that movie, Snakes on the Plane. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I have no idea. I don't know why anybody would go see that. That just sounds awful. The fact of the matter is, Paul's speaking from the idea of knowledge that Centering your life on the gospel and being willing to go and to do whatever God calls you to do can bring great opposition. But he says, be fearless. Where do you think Paul's joy in the midst of all this came? Because he didn't understand the circumstances of life. He didn't understand the difficulties that God brought him through. But he understood he was on mission. He understood that his life was in God's hands and that God was using the difficulties to bring and accomplish his purposes. Period. And so Paul experienced joy. He talks about this idea of not being fearless. It's, it's, a, it's a present participle. means It's a continual act of don't be afraid. I, I, I have no doubt that Paul had moments when he was on the ship and as the storm was raging and, and uh, the, the seamen are, are getting worried and Paul is uh, told by God, don't be afraid. Don't abandon ship. Everybody that stays on board will be safe. Everybody. So Paul goes and he tells him. I can only imagine what he was thinking. Oh, man, this is, this, this is not going to be a fun message to give everybody. But he did. And everybody that stayed on board with him arrived safe on shore. Continuous. Because life will continue to throw difficulties your way. As we center our life on the gospel and we live out that truth, God is going to allow for, in His plan, difficulties to come our way. There can be opposition, and that's hard. And that's why we need to be in a continuous state of being fearless. And He throws in this one qualifier. It's comprehensive to anything. In other words, Paul just basically says anything can happen from deliverance, to death. Don't be afraid. Anything. Anything. Now, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and that's a debate we can have at another time. But whoever wrote it in chapter 11, 
He talks about by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. All these people live by faith. Many of them not seeing the fulfillment of the promise. And we love the part of the chapter where by faith they conquered this, by faith they delivered this, by faith dead were raised from, uh, you know, from the grave. But then it goes on, but others were cut in two. Others were defeated. God says the gamut is this wide. I, I will lead you through it all. I promise that I won't leave you. I promise I won't forsake you. I promise I'm going to go through all of it with you. But don't be afraid in anything that they do. Whether it's deliverance that God gives or death that man brings, it doesn't matter. Remember what he just got finished telling them. If I live, Christ. If I die, Christ. I win. That's the point. And so he wants us to understand we're on the winning side. Don't be afraid. And then he goes on to talk about the assurance that we can have. And, and listen to what he says here. He says, and, be not, and do not be frightened in anything by your opponents. Why? Because this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. In other words, as they stand in opposition to the gospel... They are demonstrating their eternal destiny. As you stand in complete faith in the gospel, regardless of what the, the opponents may do, it's a demonstration of your salvation and your eternal security. Because it's from God. It's not a matter of how much faith you have or, or how good you are at it. it. This is all about God. But when you experience the opposition, don't be afraid, but be assured. Opposition is demonstrating that you are standing true to the gospel. They are standing against it. And as they stand against it is a demonstration of their eternal destiny, just as much as you standing for it is a demonstration of your eternal destiny because this is all in God's hands. So what are we saying? We're saying this. We can move forward in our efforts to further the reach of the gospel in confidence because the eternal outcomes, both of those who oppose and those who proclaim, are determined by God. We can move forward. We don't have to worry about them snuffing our life out if that's what they want to do, and they have the power to do that. I marvel at some of the testimonies I read. I, I, I get a, a regular email from the, the, the organization that talks about the persecution of, of believers all around the world. There's several of them that I get. I marvel at what goes on and the courage that they show. I also marvel at some of the stories where God delivers in the midst of it. We have good friends. They are in Chad, and they're working with a people group that they're not allowed to talk about and not made public and, and things like that. But they had a friend who came to know the Lord from that people group. And th while they were in the States, that friend went missing. They went missing. They didn't hear from him. And then what they found out was that he was taken by a group that was opposed to the gospel. And they were trying to convince him that he needed to reject the gospel and return back to his original faith. And he refused to do that. So they took him captive to try to beat him and to subdue him into changing back and renouncing Jesus Christ. Most of his friends and my friends, who are missionaries in Chad, had no idea, had no word from him. But miraculously... He was able to escape his captors, get word out. They were able to get him and collect him and bring him back. And now they have him in safety. But he refused, refused to reject his faith. Why? Because if I live, Christ. If I die, Christ. Their opposition means nothing to me. They can take my life. They can capture. They can kidnap me. It means nothing. Why? Because I'm secure in Jesus Christ. So therefore, he keeps moving forward. And so should we. 
That's what he's talking about here, is that we can move forward in our efforts because we don't have to worry about the results. We can move forward in in confidence because the eternal outcomes are determined by God and not us. Now, it's in light of that that he turns to the last portion of this passage where uh, it is this challenge where he talks about we have to be prepared for this, though. We, we need to be prepared to suffer. And that's not a fun message, but notice verse 29 and, and 30. Here's what he says. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of, the, of Christ, you should not only believe in him, we like that part, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Here's the challenge. The privilege, it has been granted to us, the privilege of salvation, yes, but the privilege also to suffer on His behalf. This is what marked the early church. This isn't necessarily a characteristic of the modern church, at least in America. And so as we come to this passage, it sounds great and, and we like it. And it's one of those ones that we perhaps have memorized. But we need to understand there's a high calling here that Paul is giving to the church. And he's saying, listen, we stand together. We're on the winning side. Yes, yes, I love that. But be willing, be ready to suffer. That's the difficulty. That's the hardship. And so he talks about that privilege. And then he talks about the responsibility. He says, engaged. Here's why. You'd be willing to do this engaged in the same conflict. I love what Warren Wearsby says when he talks about this passage of Scripture. He talks about there's three levels of engagement that we have as a believer. The first level of engagement comes when we take on the privilege to know Him, to believe on Him. Okay, That's the, the privilege of being sons and daughters. We become part of the family of God. That's a great privilege. And so that's the first level of of engagement. The second level is where we we have come into his family and now we surrender ourselves as servants of our Savior, Jesus Christ, where we participate in the furtherance of the gospel. But Paul is calling us here in this passage to a third level of engagement. Yes, we're sons. Yes, we're to be servants, but we're also to be soldiers ready to move into conflict. We're willing to suffer the hardship for the sake of the gospel. We are called to engage as soldiers for the gospel. You see, there is joy in being adopted into God's family and in surrendering to be His servants. There's joy in that. But the kind of joy that Paul's been talking about here, especially in chapter 1, and he'll continue to talk about as we we go through here in chapter 2, where he's going to really hit on this idea of submission, surrendering to be his servants. But the kind of joy that Paul experienced comes from being a soldier for the advancement of the gospel. And sometimes that means you have to live through great hardship. I want to get... I want to share a personal story with you here for a moment. Probably 20, no, probably 15, no. I've been here almost 20 years, so it's 25, 26 years ago. I came in contact with a young couple named Chris and Andrea Berner. They came to work with us in Dominica. Chris was a young, enthusiastic, energetic guy, had a great vision, and uh, his wife was a white Bahamian, and uh, he, he was just a white guy from New Jersey. So, but nonetheless, they were just a, a wonderful young couple. And Chris was more of a, of a, a free spirit, so to speak, um, and, and he just had a hard time fitting into the Berean churches there in Dominica, which he felt were, uh, was a little confining. And I tried to give him some encouragement to be patient and whatnot, but, but you know, he, he really struggled with it. And God intervened, and they had visa problems, and they had to go back, and, and they ended up in the Bahamas. As a matter of fact, they've been a pastor for a number of years now on Abaco Island. And if you've been watching the news, you know what happened to Abaco. I don't watch the news, 
I, I've chosen to stay away from it. It's too depressing and too divisive, and I, I don't need it. But from Saturday, well, actually from Friday to Saturday, Sunday, I was praying for Chris and Andrea. I had no idea what happened to them. We got word that they had evacuated their house and gone to a friend's house. Then we got word that they were seen helping other people get to that same house. But then all silence broke out, and you didn't hear anything. I don't know if, Gerard, if you've heard from your brother. Have you? Yeah, okay, good. But the fact is, is that there was total silence. And there's nothing worse than knowing somebody that you love and you care about, you don't know what happened to them. Four or five days later, we finally hear. Find out they're safe. They're being evacuated to Nassau. Last night... Chris posted on his Facebook page an announcement from his church, New Vision. Now, here's what you need to understand. His house, totally destroyed. Church, destroyed. Fox News did a report. He put it on his Facebook. He did a report. Because where Chris and Andrea are living is in one of the largest areas of a Haitian refugee, immigrant um, area. It's, it's, they're the poorest of the poor in there. And you see, you see everywhere you could see on this report, there's nothing but destroyed houses, trees ripped down, cars jumbled everywhere, dead bodies. So much so that five or six days after the hurricane's gone, nobody, I mean, not a sound can be heard in the whole area because nobody can get there. Nobody's doing anything. It's so devastating. But Chris put a Facebook post up because many of the people who survived, and they don't know who all did survive yet, but many of the people from his church who did survive and are now in Nassau are gathering this morning to worship God. They're gathering to worship God for saving their souls and keeping their vision and mission alive. Now stop and think about that this morning. They lost everything. Everything. But they're gathering in a borrowed church as a body of Christ to sing praises to God and to stay on mission. The question is, will we rise to the challenge? We still have this place. Dorian didn't get any close. Will we rise to the occasion and focus our life on that vision and mission. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your protection and the way that you cared for the burners. We thank you for the challenge that their lives and their church is to us as your people. To stay on mission, to not lose focus, to recognize that, yes, there's things that can distract us, Yes, there's things that can be difficult. But as long as you give us breath of life, you've called us to be soldiers and to engage in the same conflict that Paul did, the Church of Philippi did, the same battle, the same conflict today. Do that work, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.